Hi, everybody. My name is Bill Wright, and I work in the Global Industries and Accounts Organization of Red Hat, and I handle all of the AI and ML strategy in addition to the Intelligent Edge. And what I'm going to talk to you about today, and I'll go ahead and start my presentation, is about all the different use cases and advances that we've been making recently from that perspective. And uh, first, I'll start off with some basic definitions, and uh, there are some broad-based terms that I think everybody uses. Uh, the first of which is artificial intelligence, which is really machines imitating intelligent human behavior. And it's a term primarily used by the business community and kind of a catch-all phrase for any kind of a machine that basically you know, acts like a human. And from that perspective, um, there's a subset of artificial intelligence called machine learning. And basically, it gives computers the um, explicit ability to learn without being programmed. And so what a machine can do is basically take in information, make determinations, and feed that back. And it's primarily used by the technical community as a term, but it's more and more becoming a broad uh, use term from that perspective. And then there's deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning, which uses uh, it's almost neural network style layers to progressively uh, discern and extract higher level features from raw input, usually very large amounts of data. And these applications in, include things like uh, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, uh, computer vision, image recognition, and others. And NLP uh, straddles both machine learning and deep learning, but it's still a very interesting technique, and we'll be talking more about that later. But mobile networks are emerging as the best candidate for the nervous system of intelligent applications, and really part of an emerging single construct, a really large-scale construct, that includes public and private cloud. And data really is the, the oxygen or lifeblood of AI and ML. And mobile networks provide an unusually central <laughs> role as enormous amounts of data and related access points are made available through the network itself. And so really it becomes an amazing super highway of data from that perspective. And there are a lot of different telco AI use cases in play right now. Uh, the most popular, I think, in terms of what I've seen in the field is predictive maintenance and analysis. Uh, the estimated value by McKinsey is 2% of overall customer sales. 2% uh, doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're talking about a company that makes 10 to 30 to $50 billion a year, it can be quite significant. Uh, there's also autonomous network optimization and operations. That's uh, been in production use for probably three to four years, I'd say. Um, Elisa in Finland being one of the first. Uh, customer care, which is a very interesting area where NLP and other techniques are used. Uh, basically, it's using uh, different algorithms and different detection processes to discern how customer care interactions are going and provide feedback in real time to a customer care professional. Uh, also, basically, helps interpret uh, customer calls in advance. We've all had that experience of uh, making a service call and getting a machine, so to speak. Some are better, some are worse than others. But there are some really, really fascinating and very accurate programs out now that can handle you know, many, many, many different kinds of customer care interactions effectively. And then there's security. Uh, everything from uh, AI deployments of different security programs within networks and IT data centers to you know, anomaly detection and triage and, and taking in all different kinds of information within hardware and software to basically understand what's taking place in the environment and feeding that back and understanding, I guess, in a total sense, what the different security activity is like and lack of activity is like. Um, in terms of 5G beam forming, that's a very interesting area. Uh, there was an IEEE white paper that came out, I think, in 2018, around that time frame, that talked about the use of uh, AI and ML for beam forming activities. And that can take two different uh, directions, the first of which is the placement of nodes and the most effective placement. I guess you could say from a, a customer service perspective, uh, the most efficient use of those nodes within a particular region or zone. And then also the actual act of customers walking through all the different nodes and how to basically um, act and react to their position with the beams from that perspective as well. So there's kind of this interesting use case um, from that perspective. And they've discovered that the machine learning algorithms that have been applied are actually more accurate than human engineers. And then there are things like visual identification. And there's a lot of different techniques used from that perspective. Uh, something called the gauge equivariant CNNs is a really interesting one, which can identify uh, from almost a 360 degree perspective an object in motion and accurately identify it. Um, 
it's very uh, compute intensive, but it's a very interesting technique. And there are a lot of different areas where um, this is being applied from a motion detection for marketing purposes to uh, facial recognition, <clears throat> even to gait recognition as people are walking, how they walk. Um, that's its own fingerprint as well. So there are a lot of interesting use cases along those lines. And then there's smart city and IoT use cases. Uh, we've all heard about those. Smart car support and, uh, you know, from an autonomous driving perspective, that's a very interesting use case. Uh, recently, uh, BMW uh, started a project in Munich where 100 cars at level five autonomy are driving around the city and basically in training mode, a lot of the data that's being generated is going back into a repository and being cleansed and being reanalyzed to basically train all the cars from an autonomous driving perspective through the city of Munich. Now those 100 cars though, what's fascinating is each one in a full day of driving can produce like 50 terabytes of data and is fed back into, I think it's roughly 230 petabyte database where the uh, information is taken and processed and the training continues to take place. And a lot of the data is discarded as part of that process, but the training itself is just a fascinating endeavor. Uh, there are different edge uh, use cases as well, um, live content, uh, all sorts of different areas. Gaming is another one from an edge perspective. Uh, Real-time surgery, although robotic surgery probably is uh, on, on its way to full use, I would say. Um, you know, arguably, some programs will remain resident inside of a uh, surgical center, but edge communication is going to be critical in terms of the real-time capabilities there as well. So there are a lot of different use cases that are emerging from an edge perspective that uh, will have different levels of commercial adoption, uh, both near and long term. Uh, emergency services is really interesting too. The ability to basically triage an accident while a, uh, an emergency, uh, let's say like an ambulance, is on its way to a location. It can take in individual uh, health data through somebody's Apple Watch. It could take in uh, the location of the car and the kind of damage that it might have been that might have been sustained in the process. There's, there are all these different forms of analysis that could take place as the, uh, you could say, the resources are being applied to a certain emergency situation that can help really triage and triangulate all the necessary, I guess you could say, aid to help everybody at that site. Um, healthcare monitoring is a really big one. And again, the, um, there are other areas too that are really interesting as well that are emerging there. I referred to some of those earlier. Uh, then the gaming I'd mentioned, ARVR infrastructure as well, which is also edge-based uh, live content infrastructure. And then marketing and sales systems. Uh, that's another interesting one too. And there are actually companies today that are deploying at the edge different AI and ML systems to assist in a variety of different ways, different forms of um, retail services. So there really is a lot of activity going on both at the edge and at the core in terms of the use of AI and ML and telco. But I think for me, the really fascinating project that I'm working on right now is the uh, enterprise neurosystem. And it's really how, I guess you could say, the totality of the vision of AI and ML is being applied into telco today. And it's just getting started. It's very exciting. And really, it's all about AI infrastructure that reaches into every single business function in an enterprise and a mobile network. And so this includes network operations and uh, edge operations and then core IT, but then it applies to supply chains and logistics for different you know, retail outlets or different uh, like resupply of different locations in terms of uh, towers, et cetera. Uh, there's finance, there's human resources, and then legal and contracts and contract analysis using NLP. And then insurance and facilities. I mean, you draw all these just widely diverse areas together, and you really have what amounts to what a business actually looks like. Everybody thinks of these, or many people think of these as very different silos of a business, but they're really part of an organic whole. And so when you think about it, all these different systems impact and influence each other at some level. And so this is a way to take all the different machine learning applications that are being applied in all these silos, tying them together, and applying an overarching intelligence to all operations to really provide a crystal clear view in real time into every aspect of a business's operations. And so it really provides, um, I wouldn't say a dashboard, but rather uh, perhaps a board member <laughs> or a uh, operations assistant who has an unparalleled, like transparent view of every level of operation of a company. 
And so the whole plan here is to create a community around this initiative. And what's going to be really fun is <clears throat> we're going to create a couple of different point projects applying AI and machine learning to basically add value for some of these kind of corner cases that haven't been fully addressed yet and then apply some very, uh, I guess you'd say, tight discipline to delivering on that while looking at the connectivity aspect and the centralized intelligence aspect. So there are a couple different work streams that will take place. But um, the first is predictive maintenance. Uh, America Automobile and Raul Reyes, uh, who was the sponsor of our project initially, uh, he said, well, look, the, the one thing I don't really understand in my network is the impact of software upgrades. <clears throat> what the, the downtime will be, what the impact on other systems that are connected to it will be, uh, the versioning and all the version control, the best time to apply an upgrade, all those kinds of subtle nuances are very difficult to categorize and it's a big problem for us and for other operators. Maybe we tackle that as a first project. And so <clears throat> it's definitely um, an area that we'll, we'll kind of step into over time, but it's a very exciting area and can definitely save people a lot of time and trouble. So the way we look at it is it's one of those really nice corner cases that can basically drop back to that central application. And so beyond that, the way the concept looks is there are a variety of different Red Hat and open source tools and platforms that can be applied. And then our open data hub architecture resides on top of that. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But the AI neuro system is basically above the open data hub. It's comprised of middleware, various models, uh, different frameworks that can basically assist in this endeavor. And if you take a look, it basically connects to IT and then extends into all the different areas of the, uh, the business from there and basically starts to draw all that information back and uh, take it to a headquarters repository. But we basically launch an AI nucleus. It'll be a program that basically uh, can unfold almost like origami and deploys a variety of different models that are purpose-built for each uh, area, going into IT, operations, uh, supply chains, facilities, data lakes, financial centers, et cetera, and basically feeds back into the headquarters where this is you know, this larger intelligence takes all these different elements and makes sense of it and even takes autonomous action on behalf of the C-suite. But it usually utilizes the Open Data Hub, and this is really a, a great framework that our CTO office and uh, Sherard Griffin came up with to basically address, I guess you could say, the entire pipeline of CICD and CT for AI applications. And it uses a lot of upstream uh, projects. It, it uses uh, Red Hat OpenShift and Ceph, and basically draws all this together in a very effective uh, infrastructure to launch something like the, uh, the enterprise neurosystem. And so really the outcomes for this project are quite a few, actually. Um, there's a tremendous benefit to operators through cost savings, streamline operations. And then operators, Red Hat, and the entire partner community can come together to build the solution based on all the different production insights, uh, very uh, specific lists of objectives, and then also taking a look from an R&D perspective where to bring all these different ideas and just create kind of a, uh, a place to, you know, work them out and, and understand. And so it becomes really kind of an R&D, uh, like a Petri dish, you know, where everybody can come together and really apply new creative ideas that will ultimately find their way into mobile networks. Uh, also, existing open source offerings and AI frameworks can be applied. You don't have to rebuild everything in real. And it really creates a new category, that overarching intelligence and that single AI instance that spans different countries and different regions and different business divisions and really becomes the true end state for AI for the enterprise. And that's really the vision of this project. And um, the way we look at this in terms of our ecosphere and how everybody's coming together from that perspective, you know, it, it's funny, everybody wonders, hey, well, you were bought by IBM. Why aren't you talking about just Watson? Well, we do, but we talk about our, all of our partners in the same regard as well, because not everybody wants something end to end. They might want something piecemeal and use different partners for different uh, solution areas. They might go with Watson for uh, everything end to end when they want something you know, really robust and powerful as well. And then also there are all the different hardware partners that we work with too. And all of this resides on top of our platforms. Our design is to be completely open and hybrid from a cloud perspective. So you can really pick and choose the way you want to go. But uh, I'd like to finish with just the DIY aspect. More than ever, it really is a, a somewhat dangerous approach, not, a, not the straightforward approach for AI right now. 
AI and related environments, the supporting environments, require a truly supportable and verifiable code base. And you're going to be handing over some significant operational capability to all these applications. And uptime, as we all know, is, is non-negotiable. So if any of these systems go off kilter and system-wide outages take place, et cetera, um, you know, you have to find a way to triage it as quickly and rapidly as you can. And if you're building these bespoke models on unsupported platforms, et cetera, or, uh, you know, ones that aren't as uh, secure from that perspective, it's going to be a problem on a number of levels. But compliance will be a really big one because as time goes on, I think there's going to be more regulatory uh, oversight applied to all these different AI applications and new standards are going to be implemented. Um, Basically, who's going to support all this for you? And if a data scientist leaves and a couple of generations of data scientists come and go from your company, it's going to be difficult to really understand what is taking place. So I think building models that are very carefully articulated, very transparent, and you really understand how everything was achieved within that perspective, if you can follow and map that very carefully, and then use supported platforms, you know, like open source platforms that Red Hat provides, I think it's a much safer route and a much more a stable route for long-term implementations. But I just want to thank you for your time, and that pretty much concludes my presentation. Uh, again, my name is Bill Wright. Feel free to reach out to me by email at bwright, B-W-R-I-G-H-T, at redhat.com, and I'll be more than happy to help you with uh, any of your questions. So thank you very much, and uh, have a great day.